Okay, hello, welcome to week 12. This week we will explore what I call an anti-state art alongside thinking what we can understand uh, by looking at these range of objects and what it tells us about our history. In doing so, I hope to orientate our perspective to look at spaces and objects that are often left out of mainstream art history proper and how they can complicate our understanding of art history as a linear progressive timeline or an expression of civilizational sophistication. So our discussion begins in an area, a part of Southeast Asia that's been described as the Sulu zone, which you see on the map here. This is an area that might be remote or distant when we often think of uh, places uh, that are significant in early modern history. But if we were to consider how a history of place is really a node within a network, uh, this can give us a very different idea of how uh, plate, a site is connected to a global economy and what we can learn about uh, how objects uh, circulate and gain meaning uh, through such entanglements. So to give you a bit of a background, the world system of the Sulu zone can be understood as such. Uh, there is strong Chinese demands for exotic commodities such as trepang, uh, which is a kind of shell, a, a seashell, and a bird's nest. And now this becomes of great interest to the Europeans in the early uh, in the 18th century. So as a result of this, new anthropods began to emerge in the Sulu Sea. The island of Jolo, which you see in the upper bit of the map, uh, became a major center for cross-cultural trade in the late 18th century. Uh, the Tao Su ethnic community made up principally the trading elites uh, of this particular trading port, uh, which was run by a sultanate called the Sulu Sultanate. Uh, they were locked into a vast web of trade and exchange, often involving exploitation of rich tropical resources uh, of the area around it, uh, with producers, distributors, and controllers often entangled in a very complex set of relationships uh, and uh, forming structural dependencies. So English traders uh, coming here uh, to trade wanted all these bird's nests primarily to trade with China, right? Seashells and bird nets that were very popular in China and were in demand in China. And English traders came uh, to exchange for these goods, uh, the manufactured industrial goods, uh, often with the Taosu, Datos, and leading inhabitants in, re in return for all the bird's nests that they, they required to trade with China. So the acquisition and monopolization of the goods and the trade with outsiders allowed the Taosu to produce wealth and use this wealth to build influence as well as prestige power. So peripheral societies around it, therefore, were drawn into this web of exchange. Local notables emerge as forms, formal political relationships with communities, uh, forge uh, through bonds of kinship and marriage. Uh, however, the problem is sustaining such a market resulted not only in the exploitation of natural resources, but also labor power of peripheral communities, rapid increase in trade goods and revenues, uh, and improved firearms, uh, allowed for mobile marauding communities uh, to uh, roam around uh, Southeast Asia to build a more coercive, bureaucratically organized economy and state. So to meet the demands of such a labor power, the Tao so would equip uh, the Iranun and the Bajau Samal uh, uh, slave, what uh, they would equip them with what is uh, called a slave raiding vessel. And these were ships that were sent out all across Southeast Asia uh, uh, in a very organized and systematic manner to capture people. Right? So all these captured people from across Southeast Asia, uh, often uh, numbering up to a thousand, were seized by these sea raiders to put to work. As a result of this captive population, they were soon assimilated into uh, either the Iranuns or the Sama Bajau uh, population. 
uh, as a result of this, this complicated our understanding of what we understand to be Sama, Bajau, uh, ethnicity as a category that is fixed. Rather, it, is, it was something that was constantly readjusted as many captives or slaves became part of what is known as Sama Bajau community today. In, in effect, what it shows is that identity was something, even ethnic identity, what we understand to be the cultural basis of ethnic identity was something that was fluid as well at this period of time. And nothing better represents this kind of adaptive and fluid nature of identity than when we look at something called uh, the Sheffield knife and how market forces as a type of power really shape certain kind of movement between two worlds. Uh, so uh, how the knife then came to be uh, part of this story that I'm trying to tell is that it is connected to the exchange of pearls uh, uh, from the 18th century. So at the bottom of the reef, an expert Baja, uh, Sama Baja diver would collect these uh, pearls for shipment uh, uh, and, and sold to the European. However, uh, the pearls uh, that were collected were then exchanged for a steel knife. So these steel knives were manufactured in Sheffield, which was becoming an industrial heart of uh, the UK at that time. Of course, the pearl themselves uh, ended up in London as priceless commodity, uh, part of the China trade uh, to be crafted into a ring or a necklace and then that became a symbol of royal authority and uh, you know uh, of, of prestige in the European class system however the Sheffield knife um, entered a different world and was repurposed right uh, they were brought over by the English trader to Jolo as weapons and spurred the improvement among the Taosuk and the Bajau Samals in terms of their artisanal skills uh, in manufacturing weapons and fighting methods as well. Uh, in turn, it also influenced how uh, the wood carving and boat building and martial traditions locally. Uh, so things that are considered alien to uh, the Sulu way of life, uh, you know, especially the Sama Bajau, who were previously known to be monomatic, uh, uh, now they are imbricated within this very entangled system of uh, trade and exchange that had global ramification. The Sheffield knife entered into a, a particular culture, uh, and, uh, uh, and and acquired new kind of meaning because uh, the lightweight, dependable knife represented really the highest quality of merchandise uh, that Sheffield technology produced back then. And, and there was prestige uh, attached to owning such a tool. Uh, so when trade knife now uh, really serve a different kind of need than either the manufacturer or the trader could have envisaged because it acquired uh, social prestigious value. The knife now became a Bajau Samal, a Samal Bajau knife, not European weapon uh, of uh, used primarily in long-distance maritime slave trades and one of the many new material objects that was ex responsible for the expansion of Taosu power and culture throughout the region. And therefore, when we look at knives like this, uh, even when we look at the Bajau uh, Parang today, uh, the Sheffield knife, its origin in the Sheffield knife, uh, is an ironic statement on the material ties between two vastly different worlds and how it, an object could be repurposed by market-driven forces uh, situated within a world capitalist economy. So this implication within a world capitalist economy is something that we want to stress even as we look at um, communities that we often consider as remote or distant uh, from centers of power such as the monarchy or the court or empires or centers of empires. Uh, and this takes us to our next location, which is in the Zomia. Uh, uh, because uh, trying to find connections between regions and do not uh, often always connect with one another is one way we can think of the affinities that, uh, between uh, 
you know, different parts of Southeast Asia. So as diverse as the cultural makeup of um, the highlands of Southeast Asia can be that borders uh, China, the anthropologist James Scott uh, suggests that the highland people share really one thing in common, as opposed to uh, those who live in the lowlands of Southeast Asia or the lowlands of China. Right? And the highlands, uh, that's because in the highlands, uh, or this region that is called Zomia, has over the course of the century become home to communities that took flight from the long arms of the state. So rather than think of them as communities that are primitive, that lack technological progress, Scott is suggesting that uh, in Zomia, uh, that these are communities that intentionally abandon uh, the use of complex technology in favor of um, exploring the, of creating a social system uh, that is less reliant on these technologies, principally because they uh, saw in these technologies uh, saw these technologies as systems of control, of subjugation, of oppressing one group of people over another group of people. So, in turn, I think communities of the highlands are often you find them developing skills of adaptation and great cunning. And so Scott argues that part of such adaptation, for example, was a deliberate choice to abandon writing altogether. And in doing so, the Hill people saw uh, greater flexibility and plasticity in oral storytelling uh, and see this on advantageous terms. This allowed them to develop a very pliant sense of identity and versatile relationship to culture. So this allowed the people of Zomia, the hill, to form a flexible relationship to their past, as well as adapt history strategically to current circumstances and in response to ever-shifting new sets of political allegiances and alliances. <clears throat> so let's look at something called the story cloth. And story cloths are not really historically part of uh, uh, Zomia weaving tradition. Um, in fact, it emerged sometime in the 1970s, uh, principally developed by women in refugee camps who began to make story cloths uh, during the 70s because they wanted to remember the past and pass down what they've learned growing up in, uh, for example, Laos uh, and what they've witnessed during the war during that time. So what an individual artist uh, choose to highlight depends really on his perspective uh, regarding what is true about the history of the Hmong people. And in this way, uh, we can think of story cloth as embodying a crucial characteristic of uh, Hmong's under, uh, the Hmong people's understanding of uh, history meaning that history serves very specific purpose. It is not just a neutral recording of the past. It is something that is uh, flexible enough to be used uh, to express uh, a certain emotionally driven, collectively meaningful and historically irreplaceable ideas of reality that would otherwise remain hidden. So uh, if national records tend to not focus on uh, the lives of the, the people who lived in border territory. So in the uh, story clock, for example, we, that we, we're seeing here, uh, we see how the women uh, 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 storytellers were uh, at least interested in commemorating how the Hmong people had to flee China crossing the Red and Black Rivers into Vietnam. And this was part of a very central uh, uh, historical memory uh, that is very rooted in a personal experience that uh, is remembered through uh, its visualization as a story cloth. So here, perhaps we can think of storytelling as a form of genealogical recitation. And, but this form is very different from how we understand genealogy as principally uh, a, a, a structured line of descent, uh, right, uh, that we see previously, for example, in the form of the Sansila or even in the Tupu, uh, the Chinese ancestral record. 
instead uh, here what we see is that it is a form of telling that speaks to a uh, uh, to personal and family histories and allow give them the opportunity to carry certain historical weight so they chart this personal and seemingly inconsequential family histories as a kind of purposive history uh, and this renders events uh, that are remembered meaningful uh, even if they appear uh, cosmic uh, and at times also whimsical uh, and even very uh, idiosyncratic on some nature uh, uh, in some instances so in such stories i think the sto in the story that takes on new significance uh, very often they permute they change with each retelling uh, but the form of history recording is that we really can think of the creative and political potentiality of this type of uh, storytelling as world-building in nature. So they're inventive, they're encompassing, uh, and they aspire towards uh, uh, communicating certain uh, emotional intensity and depth to the viewer more than uh, actual historical information uh, or historical facts, right? Uh, historically, though, uh, if one were to observe the traditional textiles woven uh, by the Hmong people, they are largely in the form of striations. So they're like long, thin stripes, right? Uh, lines, geometric lines. And across the Zomia region, the same pattern of striation is often visible in weaving of textile baskets and carpets. So anthropologists have um, um, called attention to, um, explore, uh, to, to these decorative patterns' uh, uh, capacity to function as a kind of text or a kind of language. Uh, uh, for example, in Angela Sheng's uh, writing with thread, traditional textiles of Southwest Chinese minorities, I think she discusses how you can read these costumes as texts and decode them to understand the myths and narratives of a community in the weaving patterns. We have seen how among the uh, Zomia, uh, among the people of Zomia, that this has been something that has been passed on from generations to generations. Every girl is required to learn how to weave, uh, and this is considered often as marking her rite of passage into womanhood. Weaving. weaving then it's not merely an oral narrative, right? Uh, because ultimately, when we think of the Zomia Highland, it lacks history. Uh, history in the sense that it, it is uh, a remembrance of the past, that it's recorded in textual form. But, um, uh, but this is a story that is not only passed on through oral tradition. It is in the Hendry craft that gives some kind of uh, relay to this commemorative memory, uh, yeah, right? So in a sense that the weaving patterns themselves carry some kind of communitarian identity because more than language itself, more than just the beliefs that's passed on through rituals, it is the difference in the striation uh, design of these uh, uh, weave textiles that come to signify something unique about the Zomia region. Uh, what is noticeable is there's an absence of biological figures in the weaving design. And also, interestingly enough, you don't really see a lot of circular motifs. There's a total absence of circles uh, in you know, the design of uh, Zomia uh, craft uh, uh, textiles or objects, right? Uh, handicraft objects. So while, one can see, while you, know, you are able to sort of... Uh, see a rich imagery of weaving design in other parts of the world, uh, you know, the absence of these uh, more circular or, or biogra biological uh, f figures uh, is uh, quite distinct to uh, the highland regions of Zomia. Uh, so scholars have been sort of trying to figure out what, what does it sort of signify, what does it mean, right? Uh, so part of uh, this triration, I think, is connected to uh, 
the terracing technology uh, that then exemplifies a kind of cosmological worldview uh, of the Jomia. So the terracing of highlands to produce food grains uh, in many ways are thought by anthropologists to have an equivalent in the terracing pattern of handicrafts uh, that produces identity. So for the Zomia region uh, and the people in Zomia, these two aspects are the most uh, essential uh, part of uh, how they understand their place in the world. Uh, the terrace of hill, terracing of hills to produ produces food, or the terracing uh, of striation pattern produces a cultural identity and an idea of how you can understand your place in society. So there are clues to this in the reverence of hornbills amongst the Zomia. Uh, hornbills are found in the highland regions and used as emblems by various communities. Among some uh, communities, there's the uh, celebration of the hornbill festival as a great time for the coming together of different communities. Uh, the hornbills, feathers, beaks, behavior, even the sound, often used as uh, certain kinds of cultural marker. So even the way the feathers uh, uh, arrange the, the colored uh, bands uh, of, of feathers on the hornbill is often thought to be a reflection of a terracing process. But I think more, most importantly about the hornbill is that it, it, they actually have a, a, a way of terracing the habitat themselves. So the hornbills require, of course, large trees for nesting and sufficient supply of food. And this determines the size of the habitat area to support the hornbill population. Hornbill species then uh, have very specific set of requirements for them to uh, thrive. And this makes several species uh, often uh, uh, requiring them to simultaneously occupy the same habitat. They do so by occupying different heights in the canopy of a tree uh, as a kind of arrangement uh, that they figure out amongst themselves, right, amongst different species. Uh, in the forests of Thailand, for example, ornithologists have found nine hornbill species living together in the same habitat. The partitioning of the habitat uh, is by feeding at different heights of the canopy and therefore in many ways uh, reflecting the kind of terracing system that is going on uh, that you see uh, in how the hills are being cultivated uh, uh, for, uh, for livelihood. So in a sense, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, there is a kind of mental act into bringing coherence into social complexity through which many different communities, different speaking different cultural, different languages and different groups, many different communities who are running away from uh, the long arm of the state are able to simultaneously coexist uh, in the highlands of Zomia, uh, often occupying different heights or different areas. Uh, this is not entirely free of hierarchy. Uh, of course, if you want to compare this, uh, one of the best comparisons to make is in relation to the control of water irrigation system operated by temples in Bali that gets uh, data state um, explores and how that can actually reproduce certain kind of hierarchies, uh, uh, class hierarchies of its own, uh, principally through the control of the irrigation system. But what it shows here is that perhaps there's another way of thinking about terracing. After all, the inhabitants of Zomia suggest that uh, one could uh, live, uh, one could express terracing as uh, a type of social compact, uh, one that is less so about the domination of external actors and an attempt by the state to create stratification within space. Rather, you can uh, take ownership of this system uh, in order to produce a, a compact that allows for coexistence. So when we think of Zomia weaving tradition and its uh, preference for uh, striations or lines that runs across the textile in a horizontal manner, uh, 
um, it in many ways has a reflection in uh, the landscape and the ecology uh, that is centered on building a different kind of social compact. Uh, and even if we do not acknowledge this as being entirely free from hierarchy, it is uh, interesting to at least remember that there is a peculiar characteristic amongst the Zomia to avoid circles. And if the circle is exemplified by the mandala par excellence, uh, this circle is rooted in concepts of recurrence with fixed property, but in Zomia, I think movement is often thought of as escape, as lines of flight, as being moving away, uh, as as an expression of perpetual, uh, as a perpetual and non-recursive kind of flight away from controls and centers of power. So when we think of the Hornbill, in this sense, we are able to connect the Zomia also to another part of uh, the world. And now we look at uh, the peacemaking uh, tradition in Borneo uh, amongst the Kayan tribes. Uh, what you see on the screen here is a photograph that commemorates a historical event recorded in colonial accounts as the Great Savage Peacemaking Ceremony held in Marudi, Sarawak in 1899. The ceremony was designed to pacify HO bloody feuds and promote goodwill and trading amongst uh, the 6,000 people gathered for that occasion in 1899, uh, including uh, a, a few notables, Kayans such as Sabah Irang uh, for the Badeng, Taman Odin Silong, and Taman Balang Deng for the Kenyas, and Long Pokun, Tama Apeng, Buliang and Jangan for the Tinga people, and Tamabulan for the Baram people. So this group photo performs a kind of symbolic staging of the event. Um, it shows one faction of the warring party with the Kenya and Kayan chief seated on a dais or a platform. Uh, and they are flanked by two large wooden sculptures and surrounded by followers. So included in the composition are also wooden sculpted uh, hornbill, uh, suspended above as if in mid-flight, right? uh, highlighting the significance of the bird omen as a central divinatory process uh, to the Petutong ritual ceremony. So as the resident of the Baram district, Charles Hose, uh, would uh, describe this event, he was often attributed as the event's mastermind However, recent scholarship have challenged this uh, accounting, uh, reconsidering especially the role of the Kenya chief, Tama Bulan, uh, who actually worked through the other system or the system of customary law in order to make peace through the Petutong ritual. So the staging suggests how crucial local other processes and knowledge systems uh, can be and they played an important role in legitimizing the process of peacemaking, even if this peacemaking ceremony would ultimately serve uh, a colonial agenda in the end of the day. So in turn, this questions the achievement of hosts uh, while recognizing the political will of local chiefs to promote peace and trade in the interest of pursuing opportunities and to acquire economically and socially prestigious goods for themselves and their own people. Uh, right? uh, and here, uh, and part of this um, adat was, uh, uh, there was a very lengthy preparation process and this can be seen in uh, the, how Local chiefs were required to check the phases of the moon in advance, observing birds and animal omens, and make lengthy negotiations with other local chiefs. Uh, and this suggests that local perspective of the rituals and symbols of the event were very solidly uh, central to the entire peacemaking process. And this highlights how it must be a local event, really, based on a local custom and value and that the Kenya chiefs themselves had 
a significant part in determining the symbolic material aspects of the ritual, such as the building of this huge pachalong or ghost uh, hornbill, which was constructed with a head carved by Iban Fortman with the budding shields making the body imitated a Kenya and budding custom of making hornbill a Fiji. Uh, in this shape like a bird about to fly out uh, and used to symbolize that occasion of really coming together uh, and in fact as a composite of made up of different weaponry as well as sculpted parts by uh, different communities uh, this composite sculpture uh, takes on resonance as a unifying symbol but more than represent, I think it taps into a reservoir of thinking about how objects operate within such ritualistic context and its capacity to affect certain kind of change and certain kind of meaning uh, and uh, uh, producing certain kind of understanding through expression uh, in a social setting. So in Alexander Nagel and Christopher Wood's uh, book called The Anachronistic Renaissance, uh, it's actually worth a read, and I included this in week 14's reading. They discuss about the concept of double historicity. That is, one might know that uh, an object were fabricated in the present day or in a recent past but at the same time, recognize and value them and use them as if they are very, very old things. This was not a matter of collective naivete or indolence or rather systematic delusion or semi-delusion. So part of this um, half lie of double historicity is that you often, it is often accompanied by a relative ignorance about the real production of histories. Uh, but it was not simply a way of masking ignorance. Rather, the artifacts might as well be very old. It was, a re it was perhaps a way to exploit ignorance. Uh, in this sense, uh, Nagel and Wood suggest that artworks, especially when we understand them in its ritualistic or ceremonial or religious context, are really adepts of time, and that objects often took up multiple residencies in time by presenting itself as a token or a type, a type associated with an origin, perhaps mythical or only dimly perceived, an origin enforcing a general categorical continuity across a sequence of tokens. Under such a model of temporal life of artifacts, one token or replica effectively substituted for another. Classes of artifacts were grasped as chains of substitutable replicas, and these stretches out across time and space.